Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the 8th Annual Seattle ERIC Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the course director. Uh, the title of the course today is Genetic Epidemiology. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Karen Edwards, an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Institute for Public Health Genetics and the director of the Center for Genomics and Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, the title of uh, Dr. Edwards' talk today is Genetic Association Studies, Dr. Edwards. Okay, so we're going to um, talk about two different types of genetic association studies. First, we're going to talk about some issues related to case controlled genetic associations and looking at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then we're going to talk about family-based tests of association um, as the second part of the talk today. We're also going to do a couple of in-class exercises. And so we'll start with the first one right now, which is how do you determine whether or not your marker alleles, your genotypes at a particular locus, are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? And so we're going to use this as our example for today. I'm going to walk you through the example and show you how you would calculate this by hand. And then I'll also tell you that there's software available that will allow you to do this much more quickly and easily. But I think before you jump in and start using statistical packages, it's always nice to understand what you're doing and what this means. And in particular, what I would suggest is that you work this example by hand, which we'll do for the most part in class. And if you have a calculator, now would be a good time to get that out. And then what I would suggest is you use the software package that I'm going to tell you about to actually go back and check your answers. Because frequently, these software packages, you can run them, and you're not running them correctly, and you get the wrong answer. So it's always nice to test a software package with something that you know the answer to, just to make sure that you're doing the, um, using the software correctly. Okay. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, as I suggested, as I indicated um, previously, is something you need to evaluate, particularly in your control sample. If you see deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in your marker allele frequencies, it may indicate that there's a problem, as I said, with laboratory or genotyping errors. It may be that by chance you've selected a case group that is not, or a control group that is not representative of the, of the population. And in some situations, depending on the statistical analysis that you're doing, you're violating some of the assumptions of those uh, statistical approaches if you're not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And the, the concern here is that you may either generate a false positive or even a false negative association if you don't um, take care of this. So how do you figure out whether or not your marker alleles are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Well, let's use this example here where we have a locus for red cell phosphatase, which has three alleles at that locus. We're just going to call them A, B, and C. And in this case, it was based on a random sample of individuals from the population, so not selected on any kind of disease status. And what we wanted to do was look at the genotype frequencies in that population and then determine whether or not those frequencies were in agreement or were in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And I, I know that we're not really defining Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium here, so that would be probably one of the things you would want to look up on a, on a glossary on the web. As I said, there are some very nice ones out there. But the most important principle for conducting your study is that these markers should be consistent with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So what we observe in the population when we genotype these 178 individuals are these genotype frequencies. Given that we have three alleles, remember people can have a big A, big A, big A, big B, big A, big C, BB, BC, or CC. These are the possible genotypes. And these are the number of individuals we observed in each of these genotypic classes. And you can see, for example, this C allele must be quite rare because out of this sample of 178 individuals, we do not observe anybody with the CC genotype. Okay. 
So how do we determine whether or not these markers are consistent with Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, these alleles? Well, the first thing we have to do is understand that uh, the tests that we're looking at are null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is that we are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And the test statistic that we're going to use to evaluate this is a chi-square test. And what we're going to do is look at the observed and expected values of these genotypic classes. And so the statistic will just be a traditional observed minus expected squared divided by the expected values. So you can see from our example that we know what the observed uh, genotype frequencies are. Now we have to go through and calculate what the expected genotype frequencies would be under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We have three alleles. A, B, and C, the frequency of these have to add up to 1. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to free figure out what the frequency of each of the alleles are or would be expected under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So um, what we're going to do here is look at all the genotypic classes that we have and figure out what the frequency of the A allele is. And you'll notice that for individuals who have the AA genotype, that actually counts twice because they have two A alleles in that genotype. So what we're doing here is we're counting up how many A alleles we observe in the population. So there are 17 individuals that are AA genotype. So we're going to have 2 times 17. Plus we have 86 individuals who have the AB genotype. Plus, we have five individuals who have the AC genotype. And then there are no other A alleles present um, in the rest of those uh, classes because they're all B or C alleles. Okay? So this is the number of A alleles we have. So we would add those up and then we would divide by our denominator. Now in this case, we have 178 individuals. But now we're actually considering chromosomes, not individuals. Okay? So each individual has two chromosomes. So now our denominator is 356 chromosomes. And I'll try to indicate when I'm talking about chromosomes and when I'm talking about people. Okay? So in this case, we're looking at 356 chromosomes. And if we add that up and divide it, we should get something of about 0.035, oh, not 0, oh, that's right, I've got it right, 0 0.3511 or so. So the frequency of the A allele is 0.35, 35%. Okay, then we're going to do the same thing to figure out what the frequency of the B alleles are in the population. So it's going to be exactly the same process. The AA genotype contains no B alleles. Um, the AB genotype, we have 86 people there, 86 chromosomes that <coughs> carry the B allele. Um, the AC genotype has no B alleles. The BB genotype has 61, so that's going to be 2 times 61 because they're both chromosomes, two um, BBs. And then the BC genotype, we have nine chromosomes carrying the B allele. And again, we divide that by 356, and that's going to be uh, 0.609, or 0.61 if we round off. Now, because the frequency of these three alleles have to add up to 1, you can do this one of two ways. You can add these two together and subtract it from 1, or you can go through the same process and figure out what the frequency of the C allele is. Either way is fine, but it's going to come out to be um, 0.039. So as you can see, based on what we saw with the genotypic classes, the C allele is pretty rare compared to the other two. Okay. So this now gives us the frequency of each of the individual alleles. Now what we have to say is, according to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, what would we expect the genotype, the number of individuals of each genotype to be? So that's our expected value. And Okay. It's a sort of a, a shorthand to tell us what we would expect to see um, for each of the genotypic classes. Oops, sorry. P squared. 
So we would expect P, if we have a two allele system, P would be the number of homozygotes for one of the alleles. 2PQ is our heterozygote frequency, and Q squared is the other homozygote frequency. Okay? So this will help us to figure out what the expected number of individuals are for each of our classes. So let's write down a couple of the genotypic classes. You've probably got this stuff on the top already. So let's just do a couple of these. Write them up here. Okay. So under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the number of people we would expect to have the AA genotype would be A squared. Okay. So the frequency of the A allele is 0.35, and so that number squared would tell us how many people we would expect to have the AA genotype. Okay. So it's going to be 35 squared, P squared, oh, sorry, 0.35 squared. And then we have to multiply that by 178 because we have 178 individuals in our sample. That times 178 people. That should equal 21.9 people we would expect out of a sample of 178 to have the AA genotype. Okay? I guess I put these too close together. But for the AB genotype, how would we do that? So this is a heterozygote. The way we're going to figure out the expected value for the heterozygotes is 2PQ, where Q is the B allele, P is the A allele. So that's going to be, let's, let's move this out a little bit more. That's going to be 2 times 0.35 times, we'll round it off for right now, okay, times 178 individuals. And that should give us 76.2 subjects we would expect out of 178 to have the AB genotype. Okay? So you keep going through all the genotypic classes, figuring out what the expected value is, and then what we'd have to do is plug in these numbers to our formula. Okay? And remember this is a sum over all values. So our observed values we have listed on our slide. Our expected values we're calculating here. We then have to compare, taking the observed value minus the expected value, square that, divide it by the expected, for each genotypic class, sum up over all those classes, and that'll give us our chi-square statistic. Okay, And it comes out to be Um, 3.08. Now, the question is, how many degrees of freedom do we have with a chi-square statistic? The uh, degree, degrees of freedom we calculate by k times k minus 1 divided by 2, where k equals the number of alleles. Okay. So in this case, we have three alleles. So 3 times 2 is 6 divided by 2 equals 3. So 3 degrees of freedom, chi-square with 3 degrees of freedom. Okay. So this is not statistically significant. Therefore, we don't reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that our marker is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which is a good thing. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're saying is that our observed uh, proportion of subjects in each genotypic class is consistent with what we would expect under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay? That's what we want. We want our marker alleles to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay? So you can see that if you have a lot of genes and a lot of markers, it would be very laborious to do this by hand. I probably wouldn't even make a graduate student do a bunch of these. But there is a software out there that does this very quick and very easily. And we mentioned the linkage utilities package earlier in the week when we demonstrated the NOCOM software program. There is a module that comes in that linkage utilities package called, easy enough, HWE for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And if you call that module up, it gives you a little screen. And the only thing you have to type in is your observed genotype frequencies. 
and then it calculates um, your chi-square st statistic for you, just as you've done here. So it goes through and it calculates all the expected values and then um, gives you the chi-square test. Now, one thing to, yes? When you calculate the frequency for, for the C allele, do you just pick, doesn't, do you just pick A or B to use that binomial or? Well, what you could do is, you know, A plus B minus one should give you C because all three together have to add up to one. Yeah, or you could do the same, or are you talking about um, if you estimate the expected allele frequencies? Yes. Yeah, so what you'd have to do to estimate the expected allele frequencies for C, for as example, the genotypic class of CC, you would expect that to be 0.039 squared, so that's how many individuals you would expect in that class. Um, for the genotype class of um, BC, what you'd have to do is B times C times two, so that would be the two PQ. In the situation with the C allele, you just assume one of these is the C and one of them is the B, or one is the A and one is the C. Okay, does that make sense? Thank you, yes. Okay, the other thing I was gonna say here too is you notice that um, the cell for the CC genotype is very small, okay? So for some of these situations where you have very rare allele frequencies, you should probably use an exact test to do your test statistic. And some of these software packages will allow you to do an exact test or will automatically do it when they see very small sample sizes. But that's something to be aware of if you've got cells that have very few individuals, you should do an exact test, okay? Not your standard chi-square test, okay? So that's Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, the software to run that, the HWE module in the linkage utilities package is very easy to run. The only little thing that you have to pay attention to is the order of the genotypes, okay? It may not be in the exact same order, for example, that we have written down here, but what you just have to look at is what class are they asking for? Is it the homozygote, is it the heterozygote? And they put them in a slightly different order than the way we might have them ordered here or the way you might have them ordered. So that's why I said use the example that we just did in class to run that package because you'll see sometimes if you're not paying attention, you're going to plug in the um, observed numbers in the wrong order. Okay. There are a number of other packages out there that will calculate Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. As I said, HWE, if you downloaded um, the NOCOM package, you're going to have this module in that file, in the folder. Okay. There are a number of others. Uh, Genetic Data Analysis, or GDA, is another software program that's out there that will do this, and that also includes an exact test. So, as I said, number of um, free software programs on the web. Okay, so that's Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium. Be careful if you're looking at software packages, because um, some of these software packages will calculate Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium. They'll calculate linkage disequilibrium, which is a different thing. We're going to talk about linkage disequilibrium tomorrow, but there's a lot of testing for different kinds of equilibrium, so just make sure you're looking at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and not linkage disequilibrium, okay? The, the distinction will be more clear tomorrow. Okay, before we jump into the family-based tests of association, what I wanted to do is just spend a second talking about linkage disequilibrium, okay? because this came up when we were talking about association studies and we were talking about how if you look at a particular variant and you find a positive association, one of the possible interpretations is that particular allele that you're looking at is not the actual disease-causing allele but is in linkage disequilibrium with something else. What are we talking about? Okay, so let me you have this handout um, as one of the handouts for today. Let me try to tell you simply what linkage disequilibrium is. And we're going to talk about this more tomorrow. But let's just introduce it today so everybody's not left wondering. Okay, so let's just use this as an example. What we have here are ancestral chromosomes. So each one of these lines represents a chromosome, okay? This may be from one person, it may be just two chromosomes randomly sampled from the population, but let's just say way back in time, these were the 
two chromosomes that were present in our population. Maybe these were two of the four founding chromosomes, because each individual has two. Over multiple generations, we've sampled different chromosomes. The way uh, these are laid out is, as I said, here's a chromosome. This is a locus on the chromosome. At this particular locus, you can have the one allele or the three allele. Okay. At this particular locus, you can have the C allele or the B allele. Here you can have the A allele or the D allele. If we just look at one of these chromosomes, this one here, what this entire set of markers represents is the haplotype. Okay. We're going to talk more about haplotypes tomorrow, but I'm introducing it today so we can start to think about this. So this is one haplotype. If we pretend that this is the same individual, this is their other chromosome that contains this haplotype. So everybody at a certain, at, um, at this point in time, this individual had these markers, these alleles on this chromosome, these alleles on this chromosome, forming two different haplotypes. Let's say that here is a mutation that caused a disease. We'll just call it this new mutation. This is our susceptibility gene. This is what we're trying to find way out here a number of generations later. But at the time when this new mutation developed that caused a disease, all of these markers were present on the chromosome along with that disease-causing mutation. Okay. We would say that all of these markers are in linkage with this as well as being each of these alleles is associated with the mutation, with the disease-causing mutation. So overall, this is linkage disequilibrium. Each of these markers is linked to and associated with the disease-causing mutation. Now the reason why this is so important is this is the foundation for how we conduct these genetic association studies. We assume that if a mutation that occurred way back in history for whatever reason, <clears throat> that now way out here, generations later, which is now the populations that we're studying, what we're trying to do is use these alleles at these different loci to figure out where the mutation is. We have no idea. We assume it exists. We don't know where it is. That's what we're saying. This is our unknown susceptibility gene. And what you'll see is the relationship between these haplotypes, the markers on a particular chromosome, the relationship between the marker and the disease-causing mutation starts to break down over time. Okay? This is recombination. Over time, what you have is these markers, if you remember way back to meiosis and mitosis, during meiosis, you can have recombination events where alleles cross over onto different chromosomes. When those recombination events occur, you can see that the relationship between the alleles that were associated with the uh, mutation actually start to break down. So for example, this loci is farthest away from where the mutation actually is. And you can see that over time, this relationship breaks down so that now, here's your mutation. It's not just the one allele that's associated with it anymore. Now the four allele is also associated. So that's not going to help you very much because that one allele, the association, the correlation is not 100% anymore. Okay. Let's look down here at the A. You can also see that a recombination event has occurred and the A allele is no longer associated with the disease causing variant. Now the D allele is also associated. So again, this relationship is breaking down, it's decaying. The strength of the association is decreasing. But what you do notice is that the C, the C allele, remains associated with the disease-causing variant because it is the closest to that um, variant. And the basic principle here is that the closer two things are together, generally speaking, uh, the fewer recombination events you're going to have and the stronger that relationship is going to remain over time. Now there certainly are situations where there are what we call hot spots and that may not always hold, but generally speaking, this is what we're relying on when we're doing these association studies. Okay? We're relying on the fact that a particular allele at one point in time was on the haplotype with the disease-causing mutation, and that the closer those two things are together, the longer that relationship is going to hold up. 
So that's the basic principle behind these association studies. And why what we say frequently is that, well, what we're looking at, like this C allele, really isn't the disease-causing allele. It's in linkage disequilibrium with the actual mutation. Because okay. this, we weren't looking at alleles marking this. We were looking at this C allele, which may have no known function. It is in linkage disequilibrium with the true disease-causing gene. So that's what we mean by linkage disequilibrium. Yes? So I'm a little mixed up here. Okay. Um, because C is linked closely with the new mutation, mm -hmm. and it's linked closely throughout the generations. Right. Why isn't it called linkage equilibrium? Well, linkage disequilibrium is something else. This is where everything gets, we've got linkage disequilibrium, we've got linkage equilibrium, we've got a number of other terms you might see are gametic phase equilibrium. There's a bunch of them. The equilibrium corresponds to, um, I'll answer this in two parts. It's like the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium here, that what you're looking at is either a particular locus or what you will actually see over enough generations is that this linkage disequilibrium will eventually de decay, all right? Because at some point in time, there will be recombination events between here and here that will make these two no longer be associated with each other. So this is important, and then both of those will have reached equilibrium. So this brings up um, a couple of key issues, again, for thinking about what population you're going to work in and what you're doing. So one um, idea is that in older populations, meaning that there have been more generations, and particularly if the populations have been isolated and not a lot of migration, not a lot of these other sorts of things occurring, that if you pick up an association, especially if this population is very old, you know that the marker has to be very close to the disease-causing gene. Because over time, the farther apart they are, this relationship is going to decay. So very, very, very old mutations, okay, you're going to have to be really close to it to pick up this linkage disequilibrium, this association. So eventually, you know, if your markers are not close together, you're not going to see this association. This is why the prospect of using SNPs is so much more exciting than this prospect of using microsatellites. Because microsatellites, we said, are on average spaced every 10 centimorgans, which can be pretty big whereas SNPs are much more close together. And so the idea is you might not see something with a microsatellite. Let's just pretend that, you know, this is one microsatellite, this is the other microsatellite. If your mutation was right there in the middle, you might not be able to pick up any linkage disequilibrium with either of those microsatellites because they're too far apart. Whereas if you had a SNP right here and another one right here and a bunch more right there, it's much closer, you hope, to the actual disease-causing mutation. And the um, relationship between the things much more closely together is going to hold up stronger and over a longer period of time. So that's kind of a lot um, of information here. It's thinking about the population. The older the population, as I said, the closer you're going to have to be to pick something up. Um, for example, in African populations, we know they're much older. The linkage disequilibrium is very different in that population than it is in a Caucasian population, for example. And so your strategies for picking up this association, this linkage disequilibrium, are going to be different. The basic idea is that the closer two things are together, the less likely you are to see a recombination event. And essentially what you're saying is the relationship is going to hold up longer. But it relates to the number of generations since the original mutation occurred and also how close together these things are. Now, I'll say one other complicating factor is that in this situation, we assume there's only one disease-causing mutation that occurred, and it happened to be on this haplotype. If you had multiple events occurring and you had multiple different haplotypes, again, it's going to be difficult to pick these things up. Is it, is it true that this doesn't quite hold up for the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA? Now those are whole different things, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, these are, you know, generally our, our chromosomes that we're looking at. Y chromosomes, uh, mitochondrial DNA, different situations there. Okay, so in general, we're not talking about the sex chromosomes with most of these approaches. So does that, does that mean that as the C um, allele approaches more disequilibrium and it breaks, well, it ultimately breaks down, because it's not associated with the marker itself, the disease process itself is not changed by that breakdown. That's correct. Okay. How would you know then if they were close enough where you needed both of them? Well, that's kind of a different issue. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So what we're assuming here essentially is there's no interaction between these two things. That this C allele is like most of the genetic markers that we look at. It's just a um, random anonymous allele that may or may not have any known function. Okay? That really what we're doing, as we talked about before, is that we're using these markers to just physically mark a location on the chromosome so that we can anchor ourselves at some position and say, well, if we see something going on here, then we would think that our disease-causing gene is somewhere close by. Okay? And that's purely what we're looking at. If these two things are interacting with each other in some way that it's necessary to cause disease, then as the relationship breaks down, you may see something different going on. Now, you know, there's a slightly, um, well, we'll talk about haplotypes later and how you might be able to pick up these interactions between alleles at different uh, loci within a haplotype, okay? Because what we're using here is one marker in this particular case. You can also use a combination of markers or a haplotype to look for the relationship with diseases, okay? Similarly to what we're talking about with just using one, you can use a haplotype as well. But it's the same basic idea is that what you're trying to say is <clears throat> which marker, whether it be a single individual marker or a haplotype, can we use to pick up this susceptibility gene? And this is slightly different than let's just say we knew about a candidate gene on here that had a particular function. We knew about a particular allele that was associated that was functional. And then we might say, well, we've got this candidate gene. Let's just see if there appears to be any association with our disease. And it could be that if you get lucky, what you're hoping is the functional variant within the candidate gene that you've selected is the disease-causing variant, this particular thing. Like I said, we don't get lucky that often with that approach. But that's what you're assuming with a candidate gene approach, that you actually are finding that. And then you're not relying on this linkage disequilibrium to pick it up. Okay, so that's a candidate gene approach versus um, these linkage disequilibrium types of approaches. So this is a really important concept because it really forms the foundation of pretty much everything we're doing in genetic epidemiology. Even the recombination events are critical in our family-based linkage analyses and where we calculate the LOD scores is we're actually, in some ways, estimating recombination events, recombinants versus non-recombinant chromosomes when we're calculating the LOD scores. And this is, you can see how all this works. Okay, any questions on this? We're going to talk about linkage disequilibrium a lot more tomorrow. But I thought it would I'll take it in bits and pieces. I can see headaches forming <laughs> thinking about these things. Like I said, it's a lot of material. Okay, so now let's talk about um, something that I actually think is pretty neat. When we talked about the case control association studies, we talked about the concern over um, spurious associations due to population stratification. There actually are a family of tests that are based on family data, but they are association studies. And they are not sensitive to the effects of population stratification. And so that's what I want to talk about um, for the rest of the, or rest of the morning today. So family-based tests of association are robust to the effects of population stratification. And what we tend to think is a, a good approach is that if you identify something in a case control study, you need to try and replicate it in some way, either using a different sample, um, different population, or a different method. And one method that we like is the family-based tests of association 
because they are robust to population stratification. One of the first family-based tests of association that was widely used was the Transmission Disequilibrium Test, or TDT. Since the time when the TDT first came out, there have been a number of extensions for the TDT, including extensions that allow you to look at qualitative traits and quantitative traits. The first TDT that came out was essentially for a binary trait. Do you have cancer? Yes, no. Do you have heart disease? Yes, no. And then um, since that initial one came out, methods and extensions for quantitative traits and a variety of other situations have been developed. If you look in the literature on family-based tests of association, there are a huge number of extensions that are out there. But the first one that we're going to talk about today was developed by Spielman in 1993. As I said, in part, this came as a response to this concern over population stratification. It's also nice because it's not affected by departures from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Again, two things that we need to be concerned with in our association studies. And in a sense, what we're doing is using smaller sets of related individuals, and when I say smaller, smaller than big extended kindreds, to look for these associations between a particular allele and our outcome or disease of interest. And what's nice about these family-based tests of association is that under certain conditions, they provide a test of both linkage and association. So it's a combination of the linkage methods, is a particular thing linked, and then is a particular allele associated with that outcome. So it's a test of both linkage and association simultaneously, which is very appealing. So the basic idea behind the TDT and any of the many derivatives that are out there is you're looking for preferential transmission of a particular allele to an affected offspring. As I said, this was in the classic TDT. And what's really nice about this, and the reason why you're protected from population stratification, is remember we said a parent transmits one of their two alleles to the offspring. Okay? The allele that's not transmitted from each parent serves as a pseudo-sibling, if you will. Okay? Well, we'll go through this. But it's actually, you'll see in the literature that they use the term pseudo-sibling. Or if you think about it, you know, those two alleles, it could have been equally likely that they would have trans been transmitted to the offspring because there's a 50% chance that one or the other allele gets transmitted. So the alleles that were not transmitted form a genotype, and that genotype essentially serves as the control for each affected offspring. Pretty neat idea. So in a sense, you don't really, um, you're not concerned about population stratification because each affected offspring has their own, if you will, internal control that's genetically matched for ancestry. So, like I said, it's um, a pretty neat design. But what's required here is that if you have an affected offspring, that you have DNA on the two parents. And you don't care what the phenotype of the parents is, you just need to get their DNA to look for the transmission. Now that raises some problems for late onset diseases. It's going to be very difficult to get parental DNA. But a number of the extensions that have been developed allow you to use other siblings as controls instead of the parents. So there are numerous extensions out there, but we're going to talk about the classic one. <clears throat> okay. So as I said, in this particular situation that we're going to discuss, the data consists of um, genotype information on the parents as well as the offspring, and then phenotypic information of the offspring. And when you have a set of trios that are independent, as I said, what you're testing is for um, both linkage and association, okay? Not just linkage or just association. Now, there are situations where if you've collected extended kindreds, so you've gone out and you've already collected families, you've done linkage analysis, you can imagine that within that big extended kindred, you have several nuclear families from which you can pick trios out and do these family-based tests of association. It's perfectly okay to do that, but your hypothesis is different in that situation. Okay? Those trios are no longer independent because they come from the same big family. So in that situation, you are just testing for linkage, not association. Okay. Minor point, but I just want to raise it in case people have family data. Um, but it's still an acceptable approach to use. Just keep in mind your hypothesis and your interpretation is slightly different. Okay, 
So on your handout, you guys have um, a page with a bunch of trios on it. We're going to go through this. Okay. First of all, the uh, test statistic that we're looking at, again, is a chi-square. <clears throat> and we're using, we're going to be putting our data into a two-by-two two table. Let's get you oriented to the two-by-two two table and what we're going to fill out first. And I wrote the answer on my page, and you may actually be able to see the answer on your page. If I were you, I'd go ahead and fill in the number so that you can check it at home when you get back there. Maybe you can't read it, but I'll, I'll tell you what the numbers are. Okay. So what we're looking for here is preferential transmission of one allele above another. And when you start out doing a TDT, you should have an a priori hypothesis about what your allele of interest is. Okay. This works best when you have a candidate gene with a functional mutation. You would expect that the allele that's the functional variant would be your allele of interest. And so you may want to test the transmission of that particular allele over others. The problem comes in if you have a very polymorphic marker and you have no clue which allele is the one of interest. Let's say you have a polymorphic, polymorphic marker with 15 different alleles and you have no clue which one is the one of interest. Are you going to do 15 different tests, each allele against the others? Well, that's one approach, but you run into problems of multiple comparisons. Okay? So let's just pretend we're in the situation where, in this case, the one allele is our allele of interest. Here we have a biallelic marker, because you can see in all of our trios, we only have two possible alleles, the one or the two. I have to say that this is not the most informative situation to be in, but we're going to use this as an example. Okay? If this were a SNP, this is not going to be very informative, and you'll see why. Okay? Um, but if you're in the situation with a polymorphic marker that has lots of alleles, there you should have some sort of a priori hypothesis, although there are um, global tests that you can use to try and figure out which of those 20 or 10 or however many alleles are the one of interest. Okay. Ideally, what you have is the result from some association study that indicates that one allele is associated with the disease, and that would be the one that you would select to test if you had a polymorphic marker. Okay. So the way this works, let's look at the table down here, is for each parent. So we have to do this twice. For each parent, what you're looking at is which allele was transmitted and which one was not. Okay. This gets very confusing, and I, I have to think very carefully <laughs> when I try to do this up here. So we're looking for the transmission, which allele's transmitted, which one is not. In our situation, the one allele is what we're interested in. We're saying that this is the one that we think is the um, disease causing or is associated with our particular phenotype. So what we have to do is look at each parent and see which allele is transmitted and which one is not. Here's our offspring. They have the 1-1 one, one genotype. The father has the 1-1 one, one genotype. The mother has the 1-2. We know, in this case because it's very simple, that um, the one allele was transmitted and the other one, the other one allele was not. So let's go down here and try to put this in our squares. The transmitted allele was the 1. The non-transmitted allele was the 1. So we get one count in that box in cell A. So the father transmitted the 1. He did not transmit his other 1. Now, we don't really know which of those two 1s were transmitted, but it doesn't matter, okay? because one 1 allele was transmitted, the other was not. So that goes here. Now, the mother. We also know she transmitted the one allele because this offspring doesn't have the two. And this assumes that these are correct biological relationships. Okay. So now the mother transmitted the one, but she did not transmit the two. So she, her contribution is in cell B. So you go through each set of trios and you figure out which one was transmitted, which one was not. So let's do another one together. Okay, let's look at this one. So, in this case, the offspring is a 1-2. Both parents are 1-2s. 
Can we tell from the father? And these are not necessarily in the correct order either. Just because this says one, two doesn't mean that it was the one and the two. I mean, these are genotypes. We don't actually necessarily know what came from where in, in this situation. Because it could be if the father transmitted the one and the not two, then the mother would have transmitted the two and the not one. Or it could be the opposite. Okay. Fortunately, in this case, we're OK. Because what we're going to say is that if the father transmitted the one and the not two, we get another mark in cell B. Okay. So if that were true, then the mother would have transmitted the two and the not one. She didn't transmit the one. So then we get a mark in cell C. Okay. They, you get marks in the same two cells regardless of which way you assume this occurred. Okay. So we're OK there. Um, this trio is the same as the first one. Let's do this one. Okay. Any questions so far? Is this making sense? It's a little, it sounds good, but then when you try to do it, you'll, you'll see. <laughs> it's not, you have to spend some time thinking about it. Okay, so let's do this one. So in this case, the father, he transmitted the one, and he didn't transmit his other one. So that goes in cell A. The same thing with the mother. We can say she transmitted the one and the not one. That's another mark in cell A. Okay. Now you can see so far, we've had a lot of marks in cell A. And if you look at A and D, these are the people that are homozygous. Okay. You'll also notice that cell A and D have X's in through them. This information does not contribute to our chi-square statistic. Only the people in cells B and C actually contribute to the chi-square statistic. What that tells you is that your homozygous parents are not contributing any information to this test. What that tells us is that polymorphic markers are going to be more informative than biallelic SNPs. Because if you have something, let's just say that's biallelic, you only have two potential alleles like we have here, depending on how common each of those two alleles are, you may find that the majority of your parents are homozygous. And that, unfortunately, ends up in cell A and D, which is not used in your test statistic. Okay. So the choice of what markers you're going to use in a TDT is pretty important. Okay. okay, so I'm going to let you guys try just a couple of these trios on your own. Okay, most of the, we've already encountered most of the situations except maybe this one here and a couple of others. But just try a couple of them. Put them in the cell and then we can talk about it. This just takes practice. I'll give you a minute or two to go through this. OK, well, that probably you guys got at least one, one trio or a couple of them done. So you kind of see how this is done. You just have to keep track of which alleles transmitted, which one's not. Fill in your um, two by two box, in this case, because we've got two markers. And the test statistic, as I said, is a chi-square where you're looking at um, cell B minus cell C squared divided by B plus C. And in this case, it's one degree of freedom. Okay, for the number one minus, uh, number of markers minus one gives us our degree of freedom there. And if we calculate this out, what you should get if you do this, all of them at home, is 15 subjects in cell B and five in cell C. And I actually didn't up, add up all the others because my shortcut to doing this is I know the homozygous parents aren't going to contribute, so I don't even go through the exercise of figuring out what was transmitted and what was not if it's a homozygous parent, because I know they're going to go in the cells that I actually don't count. So there's a shortcut to doing this if you want to try it at home. You look at the heterozygous parents, see what they transmitted, fill in your cells, and it'll go much faster. Okay? So your chi-square actually comes out to be a chi-square of 5 which is um, greater than the critical value of 3.84 for a one degree of freedom test, so it's significant. So in this case, you would reject the null hypothesis, and you would say that <coughs> the, 
this locus is in linkage with your disease of interest and the one allele is associated with the disease of interest. Because remember, it's a test of linkage and association. So we not only can say that this locus is linked to the disease, but a particular allele is associated with the disease. Okay? So it's linkage and association. So it allows us to go a step further than what we could do in linkage analysis. Okay? And it gives us an additional piece of information that we don't get in association studies. It tells us about linkage. So this is the TDT, and as I said, this is quite an appealing test to use because it avoids, as I said, many of the problems that we encounter in the traditional case control association studies, particularly the issue of population stratification and also if you have deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it's not as severe in this particular setting. I'm just going to show you this other side of the page, but you don't have it, but don't worry about it. There are, as I said, um, extensions for situations where you have multi-allelic markers, which are going to be more informative than a biallelic marker. And it's essentially a similar test, but the table is just a little bit more complicated. You're not going to do any of these by hand anyway. Okay? It's just a nice example to illustrate, in particular, the importance of having informative markers for a TDT, okay? because of the need for um, as I said, the only parents that are going to be informative in this situation are those who are heterozygotes. And so a polymorphic marker, you're much more likely to have heterozygous parents. Okay. So as I said, number of extensions out there, very nice software available free off the web that allow you to do these TDTs and many of the extensions of TDT. As I said, in this particular case, what we're looking at is an affected individual, so a binary outcome, yes, no. Or if you've got some sort of threshold, you might define somebody as affected or not affected based on a threshold. But there are extensions if you want to use this with quantitative traits. Okay. Um, as I said, the literature, tons of um, different family-based tests of association. You can find an extension for just about any situation that you're looking for. And that website at Rockefeller that I showed you on Monday you should be able to find many different software packages to do the TDT. Okay? So I think it's a nice thing to know about the advantages of doing the TDT, as I said. Um, we don't have to worry about some of the limitations that we encountered in case control studies. And sometimes it's not too difficult to go out and collect parents or an additional sibling or two so that you could do a, a TDT test for your cases in your case control study. Especially if you're doing an affected, this type of TDT, you would just want to collect the parents or some relatives of your cases, and then you could do a TDT. Okay. So a couple of things about the TDT to notice is that what we're looking for is transmission from the parents to an offspring of a particular allele. For later onset diseases, um, what you may find is one of your parents are missing. They're either deceased or unavailable for uh, collection or they just don't want to participate. What you could do, you notice, is that you could take the one parent that you have, figure out which allele was transmitted, and assign a probability to what the genotypes would have been in the missing parent. This was done briefly, but it was shown that this can actually introduce some bias into the testing procedures. So that's not recommended. But what was um, developed instead was an extension that allows you to use additional siblings of that affected child to serve as controls. And so as I said, there are a number of um, extensions out there. This particular one is called the SIBSHIP TDT or STDT. There's also another TDT that's out there that's called the CTDT or combined, which allows you to use mixed trios because you may have some trios where you have both parents available. Those are the most powerful. And then you may have other trios where only one parent is available, but you have additional siblings who you can collect. And then you may have even additional trios where neither parent is available, but you have siblings that you can use. And in the combined TDT, it allows you to take all those different types of trios and put them together to uh, perform your test statistic. Okay? So that's the C TDT, and as I said, there are numerous other extensions out there. We've already talked about what the null hypothesis is and what the alternative hypothesis is 
In a TDT where the trios are independent, you're looking for both linkage and association. But where you have sibships with more than one affected individual, your hypotheses are just that of linkage. Okay? You're no longer able to test for association in that situation. As I said, numerous extensions to the TDT, multi-allelic markers, I showed you that very quickly. Simultaneous use of several markers. You can look at haplotypes. You can look at quantitative traits. There are TDTs that allow you to look at um, markers on the X chromosome. There are family-based tests of association that allow you to use larger sets of pedigrees and then the combined TDT, which, as I said, allows you to use different types of trio or of the nuclear family situation where you have parents and or siblings. Um, so just some issues to think about if you're going to consider doing the TDT, that when you have the trios with both parents available, those generally are the most informative and the most powerful, but only when your markers are polymorphic. Okay, or if you're using something that's biallelic, you need to consider the allele frequencies because only those parents who are heterozygous actually contribute any information to the test statistic. If you're not going with parents and you're adding additional siblings, the larger sibships provide more information than smaller ones. So if you can collect more than one sibling, you're going to get more power up to a certain level. Um, <clears throat> TDTs, you can do them with either candidate genes, which in a sense are the easiest to interpret. As I said, especially if you have a candidate gene with one functional allele, that would be your allele of interest to test. And it's, as I said, a little easier a priori to form your um, hypothesis. Okay, so that concludes today's talk on family-based tests of association. Thank you.